Thanks, Zoe, for that really warm introduction. I can't tell you how uh, excited I am to be here today with you all talking about a, a topic that I'm really passionate about. And that's how data science combined with artificial intelligence has us on the precipice of unprecedented change over the course of human history. And if you think um, real quick, if you look back over some really major changes that have occurred in human history, of course you've had the industrial revolution. The industrial revolution, as you know, um, was the first time in which machines began to perform the functions that humans previously did. In this case, manual functions. And at the time, there was a lot of concern as to, oh, humans are going to be put out of jobs, you know, there'd be rapid unemployment. But none of that ha happened. When the industrial revolution unfolded, of course, there was some displacement. But what we saw was a huge explosion in new jobs that didn't exist before. We saw people moving from farms in the cities, we saw a huge increase in the quality of life, in life expectancy, and that unfolded over about a 90-year period. And then fast forward to about 1950 with the start of the computer revolution. And now we have machines not performing manual functions that humans used to perform, but actually now providing low-level cognitive functions, that, which freed up people to take on bigger, more challenging problems than, than they had in the past. Now, Fast forward to today, we have the computer revolution, we have the access to information anytime, anywhere, it's at our fingertips, and we have this explosion of new skill sets like uh, data science. This is all uh, coming together to create a scenario where we're about to take uh, significant leaps forward in what we're capable of as humankind. So, it's really, I think, important to think about the differences between how humans learn and how machines learn before we get into what the future could very much uh, look like. Humans basically um, learn through evolution, experiences, and culture. And over the course of human history, there's a pretty, tra pretty steady trajectory going forward. Then with the advent of computers, all of a sudden you saw human knowledge increasing at phenomenal rates. Most people don't realize, but 98% of the data that exists in the world today was created in the last two years. That's a stunning factor. So you just think about what that means for our knowledge of the world uh, around us. Now machines, on the other hand, we built machines to learn a little bit differently than humans. We built them to learn through simulations through anomaly detection and by trying to model the human brain and trying to emulate the human brain. We're not really far along in this latter point, but that will be something that will certainly unfold in the years to come. So machines can do some amazing things, but there's also a paradox here. There's some simple things that they can't do. So as you know, um, you can interact with technology now, you can interact with Siri, you can interact with Alexa, and Siri or Alexa will perform simple cognitive um, skills or functions for you. But you really can't have a conversation with Alexa. If you've ever tried having a conversation with any of the digital assistants, it's really, really frustrating. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Everybody's heard about driverless vehicles. Um, we, um, that's certainly the future, but there's still great limitations that exist that machines have yet to be able to overcome. For instance, you can't operate driverless vehicles in a snowstorm. In fact, you can't really operate them in a heavy rainstorm. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there as well. Now, there's a couple things on this list here that when we built this, these slides six months ago, machines couldn't do, and they're the ones that are crossed out. Six months ago, machines weren't able to create new cures for diseases or vaccines for diseases, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. And although machines were able to create art, they weren't able to create art that was visually appealing to humans. Now we can. So again, we're, we're, we're coming a, a very, very long way. The other thing that machines can do is they can really whip humans in anything that's a mathematical based or strategy based game. So those are things that you know, we're going to rely on, future, uh, on uh, machines for um, in the future. But what machines can't do is they can't be inquisitive. They can't take lessons learned in one field and apply them to another. And that's where humans come in. And it's very powerful when you think about the marriage of these increasingly powerful machines with, hu with the human curiosity. So, again, to the paradox between what, uh, <laughs> what machines can do and what uh, humans can do. A three-year-old can ace the test here and pick out which one are the dogs and which one are the blueberry muffins. <laughs> Computers are terrible at this. They don't even get it right 50% of the time, which really goes to the complexity 
of the human brain and what we're capable of and what uh, machines are capable of. Now, it doesn't always have to be about food and uh, animals, but another picture here too, between donuts, I'm sorry, bagels and dogs. Um, computers can't tell the difference, yet everyone sitting in this room could easily tell that there's huge differences here. So as Mark Zuckerberg said, we've never been closer or f further away from the future of AI. Now, in terms of some of the really awesome things that machines can do, normally when I show this slide to folks, I ask folks to say, okay, can you pick out Eve in this picture, kind of like where's Waldo? And everybody picks the scientist peering through the microscope on the right there. That's not Eve. Um, that's a scientist who is working with Eve. Eve is the machine that you see here. And Eve is a really remarkable machine, as I mentioned before. Six months ago, a year ago, we did not have machines coming up with cures independently of humans. Now we have a very, very promising malaria drug. And you think about the years that have been spent trying to come up with a vaccine for malaria. And here you have Eve doing it in the course of uh, six months uh, to a year. And that's just the start. Tremendous possibilities there. Other things that machines can do. Uh, better than uh, humans. We're at the point now with, you know, based on your genetic code, machines can analyze and determine the best treatments for diseases and afflictions that you may have way better than, uh, than doctors can in many cases. As I mentioned before, we have driverless vehicles. We have driverless, not just cars and trucks, but we have driverless uh, drones, airplanes, submarines, ships, and a lot of these repetitive tasks, uh, again, will be done by uh, machines in the future. So limitations, but we are making lots of progress. Um, I mentioned the example about art, um, and although uh, machines are producing art that's visually appealing, we, machines really do struggle still with a written word. It's got something to do with the complexity of language, and so machines aren't able to write poems that are appealing to humans or write songs or, or write uh, books or, or, or novels, but maybe someday. Um, the other thing that machines, as mentioned, just really whip humans at is any game of strategy, you know, the game Go here or chess or any type of uh, complex strategy game. We just can't beat machines anymore. Now, I'm also really excited about where we're going in the future. So Booz Allen, as, you, as um, Zoe mentioned, we're a consulting and technology firm. Um, been around for about 100 years, and we've really pivoted over the last four or five years to really focus on this combination of technology and human curiosity and what that could create uh, to make the world uh, a better place. And one of the things I'm super excited about is we have a concept that uh, we're leading up called Super Agent, and it's the idea is that you're going to help law enforcement officials be infinitely more capable than they are today. And it's not about arming them with more weapons, it's about arming them with data. And so what the super agent concept is, think about RoboCop without all the negative um, aspects of it. It's a series of sensors that a law enforcement official wears in the, as they enter a room. And it automatically scans that room and determines if there's guns, knives, or anything threatening that, that officers should be aware of. It also scans the room for all the individuals that are in it and does a biometric scan to see if any of those are people of interest or people who have uh, dangerous backgrounds. And the last thing I'm really excited about on the super aging concept is we're going heavy into this concept of microexpressions. And if you've ever studied the field of microexpressions, it's fascinating. Um, really aberrant behavior is often characterized by very strange combinations of microexpressions. So our theory is, is that if we can identify what those microexpressions are that causes somebody to flee or to cause somebody to act in a violent way, we could certainly make law enforcement much, much more uh, effective um, than, than they are today. Um, the second area that I should highlight that's really cool. We're working with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to um, really change the way we respond to disasters. Disaster response today is inherently um, inefficient and ineffective. We often sp spend four, 10, 20 times what it would cost in a non-disaster type environment. And we're trying to leverage cryptocurrencies. We're trying to leverage the digital economy like Uber and Airbnb to make the process of responding and preparing for disasters way more um, effective and efficient. That's something we could have never done um, even three or four years ago. And the last area I, I, I'd highlight that we're excited about, we launched, um, if you've ever heard about it, the Data Science Bowl. It's basically data science for social good. 
and we were able to create last year a set of algorithms that allow radi um, radiological technicians to scan x-rays more effectively than humans. We focused on lung cancer and could you detect lung cancer quicker and earlier with humans, uh, with machines and you can with humans. And I'm very proud to say that uh, you can. And so we're excited to see where that goes in other types of um, um, imagery uh, related medical um, applications. And so, you know, as we go forward in the future, there's four things you can absolutely be confident of. Machines will be doing more and more repetitive, higher order cognitive tasks, freeing up the human intellect to take on more and more challenging uh, problems. You will have machines as coworkers, um, which is going to be weird, but you will. And in addition to having uh, machines as coworkers, you're not going to interface with technology like we do today, where you sit down in front of a keyboard, you type stuff in. Um, you're going to interface with technology like you do with other human beings, and I think that's exciting. But really, when you get right down to it, what's the most exciting part about this is that unprecedented change. We have the ability in front of us to fix problems that we never dreamed of fixing before. We have the ability to create, uh, increase life expectancies by orders of magnitude, to clean up the oceans, to clean up the environment, and really do some amazing things, and doing it cheaper, faster, and better than we ever did before. So my advice to you, um, um, unlike the first speaker, it's been a little bit longer for me since I was sitting in your shoes, but I do vaguely um, remember those, uh, those years. Um, think about the future. Imagine it's 10 years from now. Imagine your field of study. Imagine your dream job. You're working your dream job. Think about those repetitive cognitive functions that you won't have to do anymore. And instead, what will you focus your time on? What kind of bigger problems can you, uh, can you take on that you wouldn't have been able to do if it wasn't for the advent of artificial intelligence? And also think about what other skills you need to be able to take on those, those projects. And I think if you do that, you can have a really, really successful future. Now, if you want to learn more about um, AI and where it's headed, two of my colleagues, um, uh, Josh uh, Sullivan and Angel Lucy Tavern, wrote this book, The Mathematical Corporation, brought several um, copies by and have it um, in the library. I encourage you to check it out or drop me a note. I'll, uh, I'll make sure we get that posted. I'll make sure we get you guys a copy of the book. Thank you so much.